uh, he got a PhD from University of Maryland. Uh, he is now assistant professor at Duke University. He also spent a year, uh, uh, he spent a year at the, as a postdoc researcher at VMware Research. And how do I know that? Uh, because I was, well, I was also there uh, at the time. <laughs> you actually managed to make it a little funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be talking about flexible Byzantine fault tolerance, which in a nutshell is a new approach to designing BFT solutions. So at its core, it has two key strengths. One is it introduces the notion of diversity, and the second is the notion of stronger resilience. So what do I mean by diversity? So in the previous talk and talks in the morning, we heard of everyone saying, we need this delta bound synchrony to hold. We also heard someone saying that uh, we should not assume any delta. I think the last speaker in, in the previous session said that. <coughs> so generally, we assume Byzantine faults. I think David mentioned yesterday that we should assume safety faults and liveness faults. So all of you have your own beliefs. You have your own assumptions. Don't worry, we have one protocol that will satisfy all of you. So diversity over here means you, you can use the same ledger. You can have your own assumptions. And yet, you can coexist so far as the assumptions are correct under the actual system that's uh, working. So then Komodo already allows for that, right? Because different people can have different K block, different K B. So very abstractly, yes. So, so Nakamoto, so, so it is in line with uh, that philosophy at, at a very, very abstract level, yes. And stronger resilience just means that we can tolerate a higher number of faults than what is known. And uh, no, we are not breaking any lower bounds over here. So let me put this in context. So we are thinking of a state machine replication system. And here is how I'll use a consensus protocol in such a system. You have a server who is maintaining a state machine. And you have multiple clients who are sending commands to this server. The goal of the server is to take these commands, order them, log them, and then, ex then execute them one by one on the state machine. So if you have a server that never fails, it's never faulty, this is actually an ideal world to live in. But unfortunately, we have to deal with faulty servers, which is why one solution that state machine replication suggests is to use multiple such server replicas instead of a single non-faulty server. The guarantee you get over here is that a group of servers will provide you with the same interface as that of a single non-faulty server. And this holds even if some of the servers are faulty. For example, the server on the bottom right is faulty. In this world, you have these clients sending commands to the server replicas. Now, the server replicas first need to engage in a consensus protocol to agree on a sequence of values. And then they'll execute them on the state machine one by one. More precisely, you, you require two guarantees, which was, I think, Ling also mentioned in, this, uh, in, his, in the previous talk. One is called safety, and the other is liveness. Safety says that any two non-faulty servers should learn or execute the same sequence of values. And liveness is a value proposed <coughs> by a client will eventually be executed by every non-faulty server. So with this in mind, let us see how classical consensus protocols are used today. So there will be an administrator who will assume, who will make some assumptions on what your network is. For example, uh, he can make a synchrony assumption. He can make a partial synchrony assumption. Then he'll decide what the network delay delta is. So there, was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of comments on what delta can be uh, in the talk in the morning. And this is something that the administ uh, administrator has to set ahead of time if he decides to, uh, make, uh, if he decides to use a synchronous protocol. He can decide how many faults he wants to tolerate. Uh, a minority corruption, one third faults, one fifth faults, and so on and so forth. So once he uh, picks one set of parameters, he'll go, through, he'll go to the co uh, consensus literature and try to find the best consensus protocol to use. For example, if you pick partial synchrony and one third faults, perhaps uh, he picks PBFT. And once you have this, the system is deployed all the clients using the system need to agree with the assumptions that the administrator makes. 
So here are some concerns with this approach. First, existing consensus protocols are optimized for tolerating a large number of Byzantine faults. For example, partially synchronous protocols can tolerate a third fault. Synchronous protocols can tolerate a half fault. And these are actually optimal in terms of the number of Byzantine faults. What do you mean the client needs to agree? At the end, the client doesn't even know, right? There's an interface that sends messages to the system and receives answers. What the? Uh, so basically, it needs to agree in, in the sense of if it believes that uh, there are a larger number of faults than, let's say you assume partial synchrony and one third faults. And if the client believes that there are actually 40% faults, then the system is not usable from the perspective of the client. Okay. So if it wants to use the system, it has to be, the, the beliefs are imposed on the client. So these protocols are optimized for Byzantine faults, and in fact, they are optimal. But the question is, something what I think David was asking yesterday, is Byzantine fault the predominant adversary that we are concerned about? A second concern is that over here, the administrator makes all assumptions, and these assumptions are imposed upon the clients. In practice, you can have clients who have external knowledge uh, about the system, or the same client under different situations may have different beliefs. For example, if I'm buying a coffee, I do not believe there's an adversary who's trying to attack me. But if I'm trying to sell my house and get a million dollars, perhaps the adversary gains by do, uh, may, um, having a safety violation. So the question is, can we support multiple clients making different assumptions? And finally, there are no recovery mechanisms. So if the administrator assumptions are incorrect, all client commits fail. So the question is, can we support recovery mechanisms in case the com your commits are incorrect? So with flexible BFT, which we think is one consensus protocol for the populace, we try to address these concerns. <coughs> First, we introduce this notion of alive but corrupt fault. So an alive but corrupt fault is an adversary that tries to attack your safety but not your aliveness. So this is uh, an adversary who is only at trying to attack your safety. One can think of it as uh, a rational adversary whose utility function is maximized if he creates a safety violation. And we refer to this as an ABC fault. And the total number of faults in the system is the total number of Byzantine faults you have plus the total number of ABC faults you have. And it is in that sense that we say we can tolerate a larger number of faults. Second, we support client diversity. Instead of make adversary making all assumptions in flexible BFT, we try to separate the fault model from the actual solution. So we have one solution or one ledger. And every client can make his own assumption and decide how to interpret the ledger. So for example, the client can decide whether it wants to live in a synchronous world or a partially synchronous world, or the type and the number of faults you have. And if you are living in a synchronous world, what your delta is. So for example, you can have a client which wants to tolerate 33% Byzantine faults and no ABC faults and living in a partial synchrony world, who simultaneously exists with a client, for example, who uh, wants to tolerate 33% Byzantine faults, 33% ABC faults, and living in a synchronous world. So these numbers are not quite arbitrary. Of course, there are some restrictions that the clients need to follow. And it is, so for one parameterization, this is what the restriction looks like. So on the x-axis, you have the, the fraction of Byzantine faults you can tolerate. And on the y-axis, you have the fraction of total number of faults, which is Byzantine plus ABC faults that you can tolerate. And one point on this graph, refers to uh, one client belief. <coughs> Orange region are the clients that we can support in a partially synchronous network. And the green region are the clients that we can support in a synchronous network. And the three clients that I'm referring to are just three points in the space. And finally, of course, if we give clients so much power, then they can make an incorrect assumption. And if a client makes an incorrect assumption and fails, uh, we give you restricts on what it can do to recover by picking safer assumptions in the future. All right, so since uh, we're thinking of clients with different assumptions, it turns out the, the definition that I came up with earlier do not quite apply. And that is basically because you can have clients who have incorrect assumptions. So earlier we said for safety, you want 
any two learners or any two server replicas to learn the same sequence of values. And for liveness, you said a value proposed by a proposer will eventually be executed by every learner. And since all assumptions were the same, you can think of your replicas as being your learners, and they can commit to values. In a new model, clients have different assumptions. So we have the same guarantees of safety and liveness that hold, but they hold only for clients with correct assumptions. The assumptions can be different, but so far as they are correct, you will have safety and liveness. And in this world, because replicas do not know what client assumptions are, you think of clients as being your learners and not replicas. So with that, this one, the proposer need not be one with the correct assumption. Uh, in, in that case, I would think of a proposer as being a, a client or a learner as well. Okay. It's it just two different roles for the same. But the proposer has to be with the current correct assumption? Uh, if he wants to learn the final value of commit, then yes. But and, and the learner role will do it for him. Well, why do, why do you uh, liveness uh, has to be that uh, the pop the proposer will be eventually executed rather than the blockchain or the, the replicated machine will advance. This is it's a, it's a different issue. One is called weight free and the other is not blocking. Why are you why, why not having this non-blocking? I think the distinction probably is you do not want any sort of censorship. What? Uh, I, I, this, is, this is okay for blockchain, but in many applications, once something is, 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 is comes in, the proposal can withdraw if what he, because now it changes its idea. You know, the next thing I want is this, but if it's not this, if I see what it is, I'll change it. So it's not general. This is, uh, it, it just, I, I don't see why you can't live with something simpler, which is the, the, the new things will be, will be, will be on the chain. That's, Perhaps I think I'd be happy to chat maybe after after the talk uh, the distinction between the two because I'm, I'm, I'm I do I do not quite get but uh, I'll be happy to uh, chat in the break or so. The notion of what is on the chain, Pardon? what is on the chain, is not, it, it's not something defined. that somebody proposed, but you may be deferred forever. So why why put this as part of the of the condition? It's it's a stronger condition. You can live without it. Why, why? I, I care about you, but the system doesn't care about you. So why, what's wrong with that? As long as the system progresses. The, but the system does not have a notion of commit. What? The system does not have a notion of commit, unlike a normal system. There is yeah. no commit. The system advances on no. not single no. do, you, do you want to say something like, some value proposed by some proposal will be eventually done or something? Is that what you think? The value proposed by a proposer, so, oh, you mean some proposal? Yes, not by any proposer. Yeah. A value proposal by a proposal uh, you yeah. will be eventually executed by a learner. So proposer is here is what's called a, a group name. It's not a, it's not a particular proposal name. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't quite get you, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll be very happy to discuss this after my talk. All right, so at a technical level, uh, we want, again, diversity and stronger resilience. But what does diversity mean? We want to tolerate different clients. What does that mean? In the synchronous world, we want clients to pick what, whatever value of delta that they want. I can say messages arrive within one second. And David may say messages may arrive in the next 10 seconds. By the way, this doubt is network wide, right? It's not just with respect to this particular client. It's network wide. Yes. So you could have even more diversity by allowing picking a network delay with respect to you, perhaps. Perhaps, but I think you would need the network wide delay anyway, at least for this solution to work. And second, the clients can pick the number of faults and also the type of faults in terms of ABCs and Byzantine adversaries. And in terms of stronger resilience, all we want is to tolerate more faults. So to tackle the first scenario of clients with different deltas, 
we have a, a new synchronous BFT protocol where replicas execute at what is called network speed. I'll, I'll get to that uh, in the next slide. And to tolerate different kinds of faults and more number of faults, we introduce this new notion of uh, flexible Byzantine quorums. So we understand how quorums work uh, in specific settings, uh, for example, in a PBFT style protocol. And we introduce uh, what is called a flexible Byzantine quorum. <coughs> so uh, in the interest of time, today I'll focus only on the left-hand side part of this. So, do we agree on the fact that ABC faults are weaker than the Byzantine faults? Yes, indeed. So if the whole point is, if your Disney follows a <coughs> person, even if you claim it is tolerated more faults, then basically what your system can actually tolerate is 33% of the Byzantine faults. Because if you are 33% yes. Byzantine faults, yes. plus even 20% of ABC faults, the stronger one your protocol depends is on the 33%. Am I right? Uh, not really, because your ABC faults can uh, try to uh, <coughs> kill your safety. Mm -hmm. Your safety and liveness will depend on your Byzantine faults. ABC faults. A ABC so ABC faults contribute only to safety violations. Yes. So and and so do Byzantine faults. Yes. So if you have set a bound of thirty-three percent on your Byzantine faults, mm -hmm. you increase your number of ABC faults. That does not change. You can keep them to thirty-three percent bounded, but it's ultimately the Byzantine faults is what is going to change the whole protocol. That is what your whole product is dependent on. So I'll give you a simple example where you have 0% Byzantine faults. Yeah, and that's No, and no, no, how many were Byzantine faults you want? And let's say I give you have 80% ABC faults. I can show a very simple scenario where you can see a safety violation without using any of the Byzantine faults. Yes, mm -hmm. but I'm saying you have, if you have 33% Byzantine faults, then you cannot increase, I mean, your- Ah, ah, so, so okay, so, so you're basically saying if I'm a client and if I am in a very specific instantiation where I have 33% Byzantine faults, I cannot tolerate more ABC faults? Uh, more than 33%, that's right. Uh, you're right, it, def it depends on what exact parameterization we have. Uh, so I, I do not have that slide over here, but I'll be very happy to talk about it. <coughs> All right, so asynchronous BFT protocol with network speed replicas. So uh, if you've seen any synchronous protocol uh, executed, uh, here is a figure that you will usually see. You have horizontal lines uh, rep representing different parties or different replicas, and you have vertical lines representing rounds of the protocol. And with synchronous protocols, these rounds are uh, two delta long, generally. And in particular, the replicas need to know what this value of delta is so that they know <laughs> when to participate in a particular protocol. So, so our over here, since clients are picking these delta values, we do not want the replicas to know what this bounded delay is. So the replicas want, should execute a synchronous protocol without knowing what delta is. Here is how this will work. Your client will submit a command. The replicas will engage in some protocol, some communication, uh, and, and reach a state. And eventually, there will be yet another client who will come in and say, for this command, if my bounded delay was delta one, is it committed? And the replica should give a yes, no response to the client. So in essence, this BFT protocol is a synchronous protocol where only your commit step requires the knowledge of delta. And otherwise, you never use delta at all. And this is what enables us to allow multiple clients with different values of delta. So. For simplicity, so uh, in, in our paper for, of course, for the synchronous part, we assume uh, synchrony for synchronous clients, and that is a message sent at time t will arrive by time t plus delta. And in this presentation, in addition, I'm going to assume that we have a single short version of the protocol, that is we are not doing this on a sequence of values, but just for one value. And we are also going to assume a fixed known delta, but you can easily relax this for different clients with different deltas. And for now, I'm also assuming only Byzantine and honest parties. That is, there is, uh, that is, you have only a minority corruption, and there are no ABC faults. But again, this can be relaxed to tolerate ABC faults as well. So here is uh, what at a, the protocol looks like uh, at a high level. You have three different replicas, for example, and let's say one of them is a leader. The leader will propose a value B, and it will arrive at different replicas, perhaps at different points in time. And 
a replica, whenever it uh, receives a value, it will vote for the first valid value it hears. Okay? So replica 3, as soon as it hears B, it will vote for it. And similarly, replicas 1 and 2 uh, will vote for their values. These votes, we are going to assume, also act as reproposals of the original proposal. So we assume implicitly over here everything is digitally signed. So you're also forwarding the proposal along with your vote. And your commit rule is something very simple. After I vote, I will wait for two delta time. So let us assume as a thought process we know uh, a value delta over here. And so assuming that, so after I vote, I'll wait for two delta time. And if I see no equivocating value or no conflicting value, then I'll commit to this block. And in the main execution of the protocol, it's as simple as this. So why does it suffice for me to commit after two delta time if I see no equivocation? So I'm going to claim that if I observe no conflicting value, then two things hold. One, value B will be certified, that is, it will be signed by a majority of honest replicas. And second, I'm also going to show that no conflicting value will be certified if there was no equivocation seen by the party who is committing. The argument is actually very simple. So, so let's say replica one is the one who is committing over here. Then we can say the following. Let's say replica one votes uh, at time t. And let's say it is committing at time t plus two delta. If it votes at time t, then at t plus at time t plus delta, everyone will hear the vote, or everyone will also hear the reproposal sent by this replica. And if there was indeed no equivocation, everyone would have voted for this block. And at t plus two delta, it will be certified because all the honest replicas will vote for it. <coughs> now let us try to argue why no conflicting value will be certified. Let us say an equivocation did exist. Let us try to find at what point in time some honest replica must have voted for it. If an honest replica received an equivocation somewhere in between t plus delta and t plus 2 delta, observe that it will not vote for something like this. And the reason why it will not do it is because the first honest uh, vote that you received is at uh, t plus delta, and this arrived afterwards. On the flip side, if it appeared in between t and t plus delta, or in general, any time before t plus delta, it would indeed vote for something, uh, vote for that conflicting value. But in that case, replica one would have heard of it within t plus two delta uh, after the vote happened. So all of this works so far as your, if, if your leader is indeed honest, uh, all of this will work. If your leader equivocates sends conflicting values, of course, we need to tackle that. We'll have to engage in some protocol to blame the leader, detect equivocation, and engage in a view change protocol, that is, changing the leader. So I'll, I'll explain, I'll sketch at a high level how this works, but probably not go into the details of the analysis. So if you want to change the leader, then at some point in time, a new leader is going to appear. And it has to propose a new value to, for, to everyone so that everyone can commit to it. And the key is that if someone has committed to some value, let's say to a value B in the previous iteration, then it is required that the new leader proposes the same value that it committed to. That is the requirement you have. And this new leader may not know what happened earlier. So if a new leader is honest, one requirement that you have is that it needs to know what to propose. On the other hand, if your new leader is Byzantine, you do not want it to propose a wrong value and get away with it. So the way we tackle this is uh, for the honest new leader, at the end of the view, everyone sends a status of a signed status of what happened in the previous iteration. And the new leader can then know if someone has committed, it will know that this is the value I need to propose. And then it can propose. But so that a Byzantine leader does not cheat, we end up giving it some, uh, making it send some proof along with a proof of status messages so that it does not cheat. And the proof over here essentially is 
uh, a set of f plus one statuses that you receive, or 51% statuses that you receive from all replicas. So you're thinking of over here the, uh, the minority corruption scenario, so you're tolerating f out of uh, 2f plus one faults. So observe that you cannot expect the leader to send more than f plus one statuses because Byzantine parties may not send their statuses. On the flip side, over here, a Byzantine leader can pick whichever f plus one it wants. So f of them can be Byzantine, and you can only expect it to send one honest status. So what you want is if some honest has committed, all honest need to endorse this value so that safety holds. So at the end of view in the status message, you want all honest to support an honest commit and send a, and send a certificate endorsing it. And it turns out the way we tackle this is by changing the commit rule to something uh, a little different. We, we say you start your two delta timer instead of starting after sending your vote. You start it after you actually receive a certificate. So that after that, if a view change happens at any point in time, you have this certificate that you can send to the new leader. So because I do not have time, perhaps I'll, I'll not go into the details of uh, this. Uh, but trust me, this just works. So again, okay. over here, we assumed in our analysis that you have uh, a fixed time delta. But observe that you use this time delta only when you commit to a value, not any time before that. And even in the view change protocol, we never use this time delta to do any weights. So, and, and that is why you can live in a world where a client sends commands, and you end up doing all execution except for this equivocation check. And if you ever receive an equivocation, you can just maintain some data, uh, some data on when equivocations arrived and correspondingly respond to clients. And, and this is how we can tolerate or we can uh, provision different clients with different deltas. So our second contribution was uh, introducing this notion of flexible Byzantine quorums. I'll, I'll sketch a very high level view of what this uh, is trying to say. So in general with uh, if, if you looked at uh, any talks on partial synchrony, in fact, uh, even Barbara Lisko's talk uh, yesterday morning uh, referred to this uh, in the first set of slides. So in partial synchrony, you, end, you use 3f plus 1 replicas. And the way you analyze this is to say, I'm going to use a quorum of size 2f plus 1. So if 2f plus 1 replicas tell me to do something, I can go ahead and do it. So if 2f plus 1 replicas tell me to commit, I will commit to that value. And intuitively, the reason why it's OK, we argue, is because there does not exist another set of 2f plus 1 replicas that will make my commit unsafe. And the reason why it does not exist is because there will be f plus 1 replicas in the intersection where f of them can be Byzantine, and one of them will be an honest replica who will not say two different things to two different uh, honest replicas. Now, you, you may wonder why is this 3f plus 1, 2f plus 1, f plus 1? So 3f plus 1 is because of lower bounds that say you cannot tolerate a, a larger number of faults. The reason why you have 2f plus 1 or uh, 2f plus 1 replicas uh, in the quorum is because you want to have an honest intersection of f plus 1. If you reduce that, your intersection will not have an honest replica. On the flip side, you cannot increase that either because out of 3f plus 1, f of them could be Byzantine, and they will not respond to you. So you cannot have a quorum size larger than 2f plus 1. But instead of having all Byzantine faults, indeed, if you have ABC faults, you are assuming n is equal to 3f plus 1. If my n is 3f plus 5, then indeed the, those things, we can, yes. we can write this as n plus f divided by 2, right? Yes, yes, yes. You, you, yes, you can. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of hard coding it uh, over here, yes. So if you have ABC faults, indeed, we can ask this question of what can I do with a larger quorum size? Because you have ABC faults who are going to respond to your values. They try to attack your safety, but not your lightness. <laughs> and it turns out to have, uh, with, with a larger quorum, you can actually have a higher fault tolerance. So, so for, is not, is 
not red f in this case anymore. Sorry? On the left, you have an f, two f plus one, but the, the circles become bigger. Uh, a different f on the right? Yes. Yeah. But I think you, you get the point. You, you want a larger quorum. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so over here, in that sense, uh, you will get a higher fault tolerance. So for reasons that we analyze uh, in the paper, turns out only one of these two quorums can be larger, the other one cannot be. But uh, probably I'll, I'll not go into the details uh, in this protocol, uh, in this talk. So we saw at a high level uh, a sync BFT protocol with network speed replicas. And one of the key things over here was it was delta agnostic for the most part. And similarly, with flexible Byzantine quorums that you can use uh, with partial syn partially synchronous protocols such as PBFT. Again, you don't need a delta assumption. And actually, both of these protocols, turns out, are very similar to each other. So in a sense, we can actually combine them in a neat way to achieve one protocol that tolerates clients with many different uh, assumptions. And that is what we do with flexible BFT. So just to put this in context with existing work, Again, we have uh, over here in this graph the fraction of Byzantine faults you're tolerating. And on the y-axis, uh, we have the fraction of total faults that we are tolerating. And the different lines over here represent different instantiations that you can have uh, with flexible BFT. So for example, if I instantiate this in the way a standard PBFT protocol does, where you expect 67% of votes to arrive, then it is represented by this line and it is refer uh, by the green line, and it is referred to as uh, QR equals 0.67 over here. And in terms of clients you can tolerate, for partial synchrony, you can tolerate all clients uh, below this line with, uh, with those specific assumptions. And for synchronous clients, you can tolerate uh, the one with this dot over here. And this is also the figure that I showed earlier. If I compare this with existing protocols, for partially synchronous protocols, you can think of them as being one particular fault model over here, which is this cross. And similarly, for synchronous protocols, it is one particular uh, point over here, which tolerates 0.5 Byzantine faults and 0.5 total faults. That is, no additional ABC faults. And to conclude, uh, when can we use this? We can use this in different scenarios. One is when you have different kinds of transactions. For example, you have a coffee transaction versus a million dollar house transaction. You can use this when there is a client who is making a synchrony assumption and he knows that there is some network outage because of which synchrony does not hold anymore. And at that point, it can switch to a partially synchronous assumption based on its external knowledge. And similarly, if you observe some sort of an equivocation, a client can change its beliefs to tolerate a higher number of faults because it sees an active attack that is happening in the network. So with that, here are my collaborators, Dalia and Ling. Thank you, and be happy to take questions. One more. <laughs> can you give an example of this alive but corrupt? behavior. <laughs> so it is essentially the safety fault that you want to tolerate. So anyone who is willing to uh, send equivocating values to different replicas is, is an alive but corrupt failure. So at any stage when the owners start too slow, this alive but corrupt would be instructed to equivocate in a way? Uh, I wouldn't. I can't really understand how this should be. Behave. How do you want to define what they should do? They should do whatever maximizes their utility function. In this case, we are defining their utility function as uh, creating a safety violation. If they can, they will try to. So they will send it, but if they send equivocating messages, this can easily be detected by somebody else, maybe. So isn't this something stupid for them? <laughs> uh, sure, but on the flip side, if, if you think of this as if they're going to get a million dollars out of it, they may not <laughs> care anyway. If, if they, if okay, well, we'll have to take it offline. Sure. So if you want to consider crash failures here in the asynchronous sense, uh, will it be too difficult, let's say, Paxos versus BFT kind of? 
I think we should be uh, able to do that. So there's already some work, for example, uh, XFT does something like that. Uh, and we should be able to do something like that over here as well. So I can answer the question. So we've done some work on consensus algorithms and clock synchronization, where we have like Byzantine faults and symmetric faults and omission faults, so sort of all in the pictures, in the picture, and this gives like long terms, and so you can then, you know, very fine can say what kind of faults, how many faults you you can tolerate, and it's also sort of understood taught in dependability uh, community for some long time that in some sense the Byzantine assumption is very general but it's also very um, uh, in some sense costly so you add more processes which adds more possible faults and so those it might not be the best way to tolerate crash faults but just say okay everything every misbehavior is actually Byzantine fault so I want to have more fine grained uh, fine grained All right, in, in that case, I'll mine the next.